On today's show, the world takes some big steps towards disclosure. Things are heating up in Washington with an incredible amount of new UFO legislation being proposed from both the House and the Senate. Congressman Robert Garcia has put forth three separate pieces of legislation, including UAP reporting for civilian pilots, greater access for aero and a covert intel, as well as adding back in provisions that were blocked from last year's Schumer Rounds UAP Disclosure Act. And we're going to dig into how those two might differ. Meanwhile, Senate Intel is introducing several new provisions in the Intelligence Authorization Act, including an accountability office to look into exactly what Arrow has been doing, massively increased whistleblower protections, restoring congressional oversight of both controlled special access programs and a whole lot more. And if that wasn't enough, lawmakers in both the UK and Japan are finally coming to the table with Japan looking to establish an organization to investigate UFOs, and the Department for Science and Innovation and Technology in the UK researching how it will announce the finding of alien life to the public. Yeah, but we're not done, because Congressman Tim Burchett told Matt Laszlo of Askapol that the next hearing will indeed have first-hand witnesses from David Grush's investigation. Are you getting excited? I'm getting excited. Let's go. There's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. Intelligence representative at a high level from the US government is saying publicly, we are not alone. Greetings, beautiful people, you marvelous citizens of the planet Earth, and welcome to The Lucid Lens, where, unlike your nightly news, we dig deep into the biggest story of human history, UFO disclosure around the world. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy the content, consider subscribing, give it a like, share it, uh, but most of all, share your thoughts, theories, and opinions in the comments down below. I want to know where you guys stand on these subjects. All right. Let's get into it because there is a ton of news and I, I was sick this past week. I'm still a little, little not feeling 100%, but we need to get into this because there's a lot. A lot has happened. It's just nonstop. So uh, this first story comes uh, from Matt Laszlo, who recently spoke with Congressman Tim Burchett, who was, of course, on the House Oversight Committee, who had the hearing last year with David Grush. And he had some very interesting news about the next UFO hearing. Let's take a listen. Grush gave a list of cooperative and hostile witnesses. What have they done with this list? Are you planning to subpoena any of them? I know you guys don't technically have subpoena power yet, but um, oh, the committee does. The committee can, and um, the oversight yeah. committee. Yeah, yeah, and that'll be part of the next hearing. Some of those folks. Yep, that'll be part of the next hearing. Some of those folks. I'm afraid to give out too many names because you just you know what happened the last time. We had like 12 people that were coming in. We ended up with three. The three were nine of mine. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. we um we could have we had some people that were scared of us. And, and so I will we I will be very cautious this go around. And is there any chance of getting a UAP subcommittee or it's gonna be tough, you know, with with your right, with elections going on. All right, so Burchette states that the next hearing will in fact have first-hand witnesses uh, from David Grush's, you know, both cooperative and hostile witness list. Um, then he mentions that the committee does in fact have subpoena power, not necessarily the subcommittee, but the, the overall committee. Um, however, I did a video before talking about subpoena power, and a, a congressional committee can only subpoena within their own jurisdiction. So it's questionable whether they would be able to subpoena military and intelligence witnesses. I mean, not even talking about defense contractor witnesses, which is partially why there is still a push for a select committee on UAP specifically, which would grant them access to any and all UAP related material and would be able to subpoena witnesses who are connected in any way to UAP. Uh, so... It, but in addition to that, they would grant them a full dedicated staff and a budget, you know, working on the issue rather than having to, you know, fit it in wherever they have time uh, with all the, you know, dozens of other issues, you know, Congress is dealing with. Um, but again, this is just another reassurance that a hearing is, in fact, on the way. 
this one will be with the House Oversight Committee again. Um, but the big news is that we're going to have firsthand witnesses from David Grush's investigation, which is the next logical step, you know, past David Grush's allegations, which up to this point have only been secondhand, even though he's hinted that um, he does, in fact, have some firsthand knowledge, although we haven't crossed that line with him yet. So it's going to be very interesting to see um, how many, what quality and caliber of witness comes forward. I mean, if we're talking firsthand witnesses in this next hearing, that should be a, a massive step forward. And um, it's, it's, it's the most logical next step for this process, right? So I'm, I'm getting excited. I think this next one should have an even bigger reach than the last hearing, which, I mean, it was the most viewed and most popular congressional hearing, I think, ever or, or, or in a very long time is what most of them have stated. So um, to know that we're going to get firsthand witnesses at this hearing I mean, that's pretty huge. I mean, this is, along with the legislation, which we're about to talk about, is massive. The the two of them go hand in hand. Um, So super excited about that. I want to know what what do you guys think? We're going to how many witnesses you think we're going to how far will it go? Is it going to be crash retrieval? You think we're going to how far will this go? I mean, it it feels like it's going to be a very slow drip. First, we acknowledge these things exist. Okay, now we have someone who worked on the craft, potentially, or crash retrieval. I don't know if it's going to go much further than that. I don't know if we're going to get into biologics and and, and what types of entities we're dealing with. I feel like that's probably going to be the step after that. But I don't know. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. All right, so this next story takes us to the UK, and the UK is researching how it will announce the discovery of alien life. Uh, So this news came out due to a Freedom of Information request by Nick Pope, which revealed that the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology is currently researching how it will react to the so-called Black Swan event that is discovering extraterrestrial life, including how it will announce the find to the public. What's interesting to me in here is it says that they're investigating whether a plan already exists that has not been made public and how the UK can stay ahead of such a discovery. Um, the study will conclude in July and be presented to the parliament, including recommendations for an action plan, noting any challenges, um, areas of expertise that would need to be called in and how it will impact not only the sciences, but society as a whole. Um, and a quote from Nick Pope here is, I'm very pleased to hear the studies being carried out because it's long overdue. Rumors are circulating in the scientific community that strong evidence of a biosignature has already been detected by the James Webb Space Telescope. And whatever might have been found, it's very possible that an announcement about a biosignature or perhaps a technosignature is imminent. Imminent, just like uh, Lou Elizondo's upcoming book. Um, it feels like we're right on cue. Uh, we're going to discover life out there as we're finally acknowledging that, oh, hey, it's been visiting here <laughs> all along. I mean... This all almost feels like it's by design, right? It's very synchronistic. Um, you know, it, it, back in the, you know, 50s, 40s, whatever, they, they had to have understood that it would be inevitable for our technology, you know, that's available in the public, to, you know, in private sector, would eventually start making these discoveries on their own. They had to know this stuff was going to come out. So it seems like almost a long term, like, okay, we're going to have to. And, and and they may have already been detecting things, you know, uh, on bioplanets a long time ago, but they just held back the announcement of those discoveries until as long as they could, I guess. Um, it, it, but I, I would I would put money on us having detected these things already, and it's been held back, you know, to be released before we get the acknowledgement. Uh, okay, it'll soften the blow. Yes, we've detected things out there, and oh, by the way, yes, they're also here too. <laughs> Um, I really, when it comes down to it though, the UK as a member of the five eyes Alliance, you know, with the U S Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, it, I don't think they can move <laughs> ahead of the U S. I mean, I feel like they're all kind of following in the U S's lead with this. It, it's weird though, because we've got, you know, 
this military industrial complex, which is behind the scenes doing has been who knows how far they know, you know, how far they've gotten, how much information they actually have. And they've potentially been coordinating behind the scenes with each other. But it's like but the forward, you know, the the public facing elected officials in these governments are all like waking up and like, oh, shit, we need to start investigating this stuff. And it's like they're it's like eventually they're going to get to a point where they're going to have to be like, okay, here's what we know. We can share this. I mean, that's kind of what the whole disclosure plan is about. It's, it's getting this information out so we can bring it to the public. But, you know, it's like the, they're making all these plans and it's like, well, actually, we've already got a plan. Here it is. Like, you know, um, but what do you guys think? I mean, is it, and it's going to be the same for the next story going to Japan. It's like how far ahead of the U.S. are, are its allies going to going to want to go? Right. Um, so we're going to take a trip over to uh to Japan now, where um, lawmakers are looking to create a group uh, for government probes into UFOs. So uh, this article comes to us from from Nippon, and you know we heard about interest picking up in Japan last year, and now it seems like this is coming to fruition. So on May 28th, the Japanese lawmakers met to create a nonpartisan group that will ask the government to establish an organization to investigate UFOs. The group will be chaired by Yasukazu uh, Hamada, Parliamentary Affairs Leader of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, with former Environmental Minister Shinjiro Kozimi uh, serving as Secretary General, and I'm probably just butcher their names, I apologize. Uh, the group will urge the government to gather and analyze information on UAP and pursue cooperation with Washington by forming a counterpoint organization. So again, we have another ally taking up the cause. Um, and and it's, this essentially was the U.S. a few years ago with members of Congress, you know, you know, pursuing the creation of an office that need to study UAP, which eventually, you know, turned into Arrow, which which each iteration went further and further in, under the DOD, um, which, as we'll get into legislation, is being proposed to correct that. So uh, hopefully Japan will not place their office under the jurisdiction of the military, although when it comes down to it, like I said, Japan and the U.S. are likely already collaborating on this behind the scenes um, with regards to UAP through their special access programs. So it's another story of the elected officials catching wind of the reality of the situation and trying to get better awareness. And, you know, they're just playing catch up at this point. So we'll have to see how this pans out. But again, like the UK, I imagine they will be following the U.S.'s lead either way. All right. Now, let's go over to the Senate and see what they have been doing, because there's a lot of information coming out from the Senate side now. And um, Congress has really kind of hit the pedal to the metal with uh, a flurry of new legislation being proposed from both the House and Senate. Uh, Last month, we saw Timbershed introduce the UAP Disclosure Act or UAP Transparency Act. Uh, which he's not very confident in. Remember, that was a very short two-page piece of uh, legislation. But now we have the Senate Intelligence Committee passing the uh, Fiscal Year 25 Intelligence Authorization Act, which will eventually get rolled into the NDAA like it typically does. And it'll have to go through reconciliation with uh, uh, Senate Armed Services um, and then with the Greater Congress. But So we also have that, but as well as Congressman Garcia proposing three separate pieces of legislation from the House. But let's take a look first at what the Senate has included in the Intelligence Authorization Act, because this is massive. This is really big. So we have Senators Mike Rounds, Mark Warner, and Ron Wyden, each having some information um, from on on each of their pages on their websites. Um, The full act actually is out now, but I just want to kind of hone in on some of these specific areas. So on Mike Brown's page, um, he calls out providing for increased counterintelligence oversight at the Department of Energy by making the head of energy's counterintelligence a Senate-confirmed post with a six-year term. That's, I mean, Department of Energy, if anyone's been paying attention, they've kind of been at the center of this since the Atomic Energy Act. Um, But also increased UAP transparency on uh, related government programs by requiring further reporting of all activity involving UAPs protected under special or restricted access to appropriate congressional committees. So the increased oversight gained by a Senate confirmed post as the Department of Energy's uh, head of counterintelligence, that's a very interesting and it's quite telling. Uh, They've definitely been paying attention, maybe watching some uh, Jesse Michaels documentaries, but 
and, and it's long been suspected the DOE's hand in hiding UFO information, you know, since the Atomic Energy Act. And it's now calling out special and restricted access programs involved with UAP to come back under congressional oversight. Uh, so that that's a huge piece of this puzzle, and they're attacking it here. So if we head over to uh, Senator Mark Warner's page, uh, it includes an overview, and I want to call out some uh, specific key areas here. So we are enhancing the IC's ability to procure, transition, and incorporate emerging technologies, including by creating a fund for acquiring and transitioning such technologies. Now, this doesn't necessarily speak to what type of technologies. It's, maybe it's not UAP specific, but I just thought it was interesting to call out because it could enhance cooperation um, and visibility into these types of technologies. So there could be issues with transitioning between private and public, and this could perhaps be meant to address that. So I thought it was interesting to include. I wanted to call it out. This is another massive one, promoting the reform of the nation's security classification system by requiring the president to designate an executive agent for classification and declassification, improving the system for the classification and declassification of information, and requiring each federal agency with access to classified information to establish an insider threat program to protect against unauthorized disclosures. So a complete revamp of the classification system, but also making sure that it's tightened up and, and, you know, things that should not be class, you know, things that should not have been classified in the first place don't get classified and, but still tightening up things that we do want to keep. There are still state secrets. There are, you know, there are still national security implications that we, we want to remain secret, right? We don't want, we don't want everyone to know everything. Of course, that's not what any of this is all about, but investigating how th some of these things, you know, related to UAP got made secret in the first place and addressing all those issues. So that's huge. Um, requires the IC to establish an IC-wide policy authorizing a program for contractor-based sensitive compartmented information facilities to improve public-private cooperation on technology innovation. So this is basically saying, as this UFO information gets brought forward, how do we allow and make it easier to bring in the public, or I guess, you know, the private sector, um, us, the general population and scientists who have been kept out of the loop on this. How do we improve that cooperation um, with, you know, these SCIFs facilities and allow them to, you know, to come in and help work on this problem? So that that's huge. I mean, they're, they're really like hitting on all these major points that will, once we, ha we get to that point of disclosure, we can bring in all the minds and, and <laughs> it's going to be interesting though, because on, on one hand you hear, well, we've got a breakaway civilization and we've got, they actually have uh, cracked this stuff. And, you know, the, the Tic Tacs belong to, to Lockheed Scott Works and, you know, the triangles are um, what, but Patel or I can't remember which, which other contractor those supposedly belong to. But on the other hand, it's like you're hearing, well, actually, they haven't made much progress at all on this. So it's like, is that one of the misinformation pieces that's been put out there? I mean, I don't. I've read so much, but it's like, I still, I don't, how can you know what is what, unless you are an insider at that point? I mean, those are the types of things that I think are really, people are going to want to know more than anything else is, um, how far have we actually gotten? Do we actually have bases on Mars and in, in other places or like, do we have our own vehicles? Do we not? I mean, that's, you know, that's when, uh, Greer comes into the picture where he's very pro, Yes, we, we, we've already made all this progress, but then we hear a lot of folks saying, no, that's been part of the problem is it's so compartmentalized. We haven't made progress. So that is one of the things I'm most looking forward to learning is, OK, how far have we actually gotten? Um, I mean, if you go back to Tesla and Townsend Brown and all the, you know, integravitic research in the in the early uh, 19th or 20th century we potentially did get pretty far and then things were kind of shut down in the fifties where I don't know, it's going to be interesting to see how far, cause they're, they're like, well, we're going to need to work with, you know, scientists, but maybe they already figured stuff out. So again, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, when this stuff finally comes out. Uh, 
All right, so requiring a government accountability office, review of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office regarding UAP reporting and federal agency coordination. So this is the government, this is Congress saying, we don't trust Arrow. We're going to have an accountability office look into them. Have do they have they actually been working with these um, these different agencies? Uh, are they actually coordinating? Are they actually doing what they say they're doing? Because it doesn't look like they're doing anything. Um, so this is this is pretty huge. They basically getting big brothered, and um, Congress is like, well, now you're going to have you know the police come in and investigate what you're actually doing, and hold you accountable. Um, then we have the reform management of controlled access programs to improve congressional oversight. I mean, and that's part of the reason this this whole thing happened is, is Congress lost track and they lost oversight because things got classified that shouldn't have been classified and they were kept out of the loop. So th- this, I mean, this all addresses everything. And But this specific thing doesn't mention special access programs, which are in fact... Um, more highly restrictive and sensitive than controlled access programs. However, Rounds on his page did specifically call out SAPs. So it's likely they are included and they've just used different language in their wording on the um, summary here. Um, and then main, maintain strong congressional oversight and enhances protections for IC whistleblowers, which we're going to look at the specific whistleblower protections over on Senate Ron Winder's page or Wyden's page. So allowing whistleblower complaints to be provided directly to Congress, if the, if sending their complaint to the whistleblower agency, as is currently required, could compromise the anonymity of the whistleblower or result in the complaint being delivered to the subject of the complaint. So basically, they have to out themselves to their own agency now, which could result in retaliation or worse, um, you know, loss of clearances or, or worse, right? So... And so allow them to go directly to Congress without compromising anonymity um, and maintain that safety, um, ensuring that their whistleblowers can't have security uh, clearances revoked on a pretext, meaning like you're, you're not just going to lose your clearance because you're, you're calling this out, right? Um, removing the cap on damages for retaliatory revocation of whistleblower clearances, meaning these agencies are going to get hit really hard with fines if they start uh, retaliating against these whistleblowers. Because currently, I guess there's a cap on how much they could they could be uh, sued and fined by whistleblowers. Um, prohibiting as acts of reprisal public disclosure of whistleblowers' identities, as well as orders to undertake psychological examinations, which, again, is another deterrent uh, for whistleblowers not to come forward. These reprisals, um, their identities being let out there, and then forcing them to take psychological examinations. And then ensuring that former intelligence community employees can still submit whistleblower complaints. So they would still have their their clearances. They'd be able to, even if they're out of service, they would still be able to come directly to Congress without compromising their anonymity, their clearance, and they would bring this information. And hopefully all of this, I mean, this is incredible. The goal is to make it safe for them to you know blow the whistle without losing their jobs, their clearances, or, or their lives, and hopefully remain anom- uh, anomalous, 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 anom- anonymity. I, I can talk <laughs> if they so wish, right? They don't want, they don't want to put themselves on blast. If they want to discreetly, you know, come to Congress, this will allow them to do so. Um, I mean, this is, this is crazy. All this together is going to reform the classification system, restore congressional oversight, of special and controlled access programs, enhance the IC's ability to work with private sector on technology innovation once the UFO goodies are made available, assuming they need to, a review of the Aero Office, and enhance whistleblower protections. I mean, this is all huge, guys. Like, they're literally tearing down the walls that have been built around this over the last 80 years. Now, if that wasn't enough, we've got three more pieces of legislation uh, from Congressman Garcia. So Congressman Garcia is putting forward these three pieces here. And so his first amendment creates a UAP reporting mechanism for civilian pilots. Now, this is um, working with Ryan Graves' organization, the Americans for Safe Aerospace. I believe he announced this earlier in the year. It's the Americans for Safe Aerospace Act, which will provide, you know, a direct mechanism for pilots, uh, civilian pilots, to report UAP incidents which is huge. We'll drop the stigma, allow this to be freely reported. 
so we can get a better idea of how widespread this issue is, although we know it's pretty widespread. Um, so the Second Amendment includes UAP disclosure provisions from last year that were blocked, including the UAP Records Review Board. His Third Amendment ensures that Arrow has access to covert intel for investigations. And this comes back to uh, Arrow being in the DOD, saying that they've got access to everything. Kirkpatrick says, oh yeah, we, 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 we're able to see everything, we're able to get to everybody and blah, blah, blah. But we know they're either, he's either lying about that they don't have access, or they do, but and they're withholding it. So this is just to be like, look, we're going to make sure they've got full Title 50 uh, clearance and whatever you know legislation needs to be put together to make sure that they actually do have the adequate clearance and access into whatever they need to investigate. So that'll hopefully take away that excuse. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But all right, so this is the big one. How does Garcia's you know, Schumer rounds the, the UAP Disclosure Act 2.0 stack up to the original proposal. I've read through all 47 pages of the new legislation. I've gone back to the original Schumer rounds amendment, read through it again. Okay, so included again are very important new and updated definitions. And I did a video on this uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago for terms such as UAP, Remember, the current definition for UAP is garbage. This one more clearly defines what it actually is. Close observer, non-human intelligence, prosaic attribution, technologies of unknown origin, and temporarily non-attributed objects, among another 15 or so definitions. All these definitions are identical to the ones originally proposed. Um, and also included is the, uh, and identical to the original version, is the imminent domain section. So nothing was changed there, um, which is interesting because I know that was one of the sticking points um, I was pushed up against. However, there are actually some differences when you dig into everything. So let me go through those really quick for you guys. So missing is the mandatory conflicts of interest review for the board members. Now, this stood out to me because while it, it, they still have the same qualifications, everything else is identical. You know, they can't be, um, they're not government officials. They can't be um, connected in any way to any UAP legacy programs. However, there was a mandatory conflict of interest review with the ethics board, an, an, an ethics committee in the government. And that is no longer included in the new version, which I found kind of suspect. Um, the timelines are identical. As far as appointing, approving, voting in, everything, the timeline is identical, but they remove the step of this uh, conflict of interest review, which I thought was worth calling out because it seemed kind of suspect to me. Now, how board members are voted in in this updated version is a little bit different as well. So in the old version, nominations will be referred to the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs of the Senate for consideration. The new proposal goes into much more detail with specific timelines on how quickly the Senate must vote on nominations. So it seems to close some potential loopholes um, with, with you know, no declared timeline from the original. The new version also includes wording indicating the House and Senate can choose alternate committees of jurisdiction for both voting in and removing board members. I guess this is to say if maybe one of these committees potentially is compromised or if they they uh, you know, find that there was a more appropriate committee to, to oversee this. Uh, so they leave that option open for them. Uh, the original version included provisions that would grant security clearance equal to that of the board, including relevant presidential and department or agency special access and compartmental access programs. This will be granted to the chairman and ranking members of the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs of the Senate and Committee of Oversight and Accountability of the House, as well as the staff of such committees. The new version does not grant this security clearance to these committees, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into why in a second. So there's another difference with the um, executive director of the UAP board. In the original bill, there was again a mandatory conflict of interest review which is again missing from Garcia's version. I, I 
I don't understand why that would be removed when they still have the same qualifications across the board everywhere else. Uh, staff of the review board in the new version does not seem to need con- um, consultation with the director of Office of Government Ethics to be determined if there's any conflict of interest either. So the board, the director, the staff, because they, they will have a supporting staff. None of these folks seem to need to go through this additional background check to see if there's any conflict of interest, which I don't know if I like that. Um, maybe I'm missing something. I don't think I am. I read the whole thing and there's nothing that compensates for this. The timelines are still the same thing. Everything else is word for word like the original, except they no longer have to go through this uh, government review. So highly suspect. So yeah, keep an eye on that. Um, All right, now we get to the controlled disclosure campaign. So all records sent to the um, National Archives should be presumed made public unless the agency that provides the records and the review board uh, believe there's a reason to be held back. These are the things that become part of the controlled disclosure campaign. Everything else should just be immediately made public unless they determine it needs to be held back and put into the control disclosure campaign, the new one. Not, 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 I, feel, I think we're kind of already in one, but I digress. So previously, this campaign, the plan for the campaign, was to be shared with the president, the National Archives archivist, and the relevant congressional committees and their staff as a whole. But in the new version, the plan only gets shared with the president and the archivist, which I found very interesting. But we're not done. So the board is still the the congressional the uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry the records review board. They are still required to report activities and fully brief at minimum the president, archivist, leadership of Congress, chairs, and ranking members of the appropriate committees on any records subject to review, which are any records that would be part of the um, control disclosure campaign. These reports are to come every year or more frequently as warranted when new information is presented. So what it looks like is they are trying to be a little bit more careful with who gets clearances, who actually gets read into the full plan, and who who is made aware of, of specific records that are up for review and being held back for the control disclosure plan. But that doesn't mean that because, because leadership in Congress is still being read in and leadership is basically the gang of eight, the president, of course, the archivist in the national archives, as well as the ranking members and heads of these committees. So, Congress is still going to get oversight back, but I think they're just trying to be careful with how much um, is shared into how many people are being brought into this, um, which it's, it's, you know, plus and minuses to that, right? Obviously, the more people that are made aware, the more likely it is to leak, which, you know, I'm like, whatever, just <laughs> leak it all, right? Um but I can see why, you know, there was probably some concern about maybe non-UAP tangentially, you know, connected um, programs. Because remember, these are probably embedded within, you know, traditional special access programs. However, this this um, act clearly demonstrates and calls out that you, you don't have to disclose the entire project you can cut out pieces of it. You can segment it out and just put forward the relevant UAP information into the archive. So they're already very, and that would be up to the board. So the board and and these government agencies are already supposed to only carve out what is relevant to UAP and put that into the archive, which would become public or made part of the later disclosed campaign. So it seems like they've already kind of closed that but regardless, it seems like they also are like, we don't need to let everybody on these committees and their staff, we don't have to read everybody and give everyone clearance because perhaps that would allow them to also learn about things that are not part of the UAP. 
piece of this, but it still sounds like Congress will get read in. And um, but ultimately, it, it does still also come down to the president. So really, though, once things start coming out, though, the president's not going to be like the one person that's going to be like, all right, I'm not going to share that when potentially leadership of Congress is already aware of things and they will be pressuring them. So, yeah, all in all, these are huge steps forward. I mean, we're looking at the walls of legislation coming down around the secrecy. We're on the verge of uh, firsthand witnesses taking the stand publicly. Other countries are finally coming forward. I mean, you know, allies of the U.S., uh, we've already, of course, had many countries over the last, you know, decades come forward and, and be more open about this. But it, we have, you know, the U.K. And, and, and Japan now are the next to come up publicly acknowledging the phenomena. And whew, where are we going from here? I mean, we thought, we thought 2024 was starting off pretty quiet with uh, the Arrow Report. We knew that wasn't going to do much. I mean, it was a garbage report. And, and, and Congress is like, we don't really care what, what you're putting out because we're going to look into you. We're going to grant you all the powers you, you supposedly don't have and need. We're going to have Big Brother look into what you're actually doing here. We're going to hopefully propose, you know. And, oh, and here's the other thing, too. So this, this Disclosure 2.0, this is from Garcia. This is from the House. Mike Rounds from House uh, from Intel already came out. He Intel or is he Armed Services? I can't recall, but he co-sponsored the Schumer Amendment last year. Remember that? And he said, uh, I believe a few weeks ago now, that they are already working on their version of legislation. So this might be they might have two separate pieces coming out because they didn't address imminent domain, which I know was an issue. So maybe the Senate and, and the house kind of have like a backdoor, you know, um, discussion going on. Like, all right, you guys address some of these loopholes with clearances and special access programs. We'll tackle the imminent domain stuff. We'll, we'll come together, you know, when we have to do reconciliation. Cause I think the, um, intelligence authorization act has to go through armed services as well. And then I think it's all going to have to come together um, in next year's NDAA um, later in the year uh, for reconciliation again. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with all this legislation. There is a ton. I mean, it's insane how much they are putting out. Like, it's crazy. Like, if all this stuff goes in, like, that's like almost doubling all the current legislation. There's been a lot already. It's insane how much progress is being made. Um, like we are on the verge of something big happening here. Um, I'm I'm getting very excited for the next hearing. I think finally having some firsthand witnesses um, testify publicly. We'll have to see how far they can go, though. I mean, w- will just them saying yes, I have firsthand knowledge of this, be enough? I mean, it'll certainly be a step past where Grush was able to go. Um, I'd be curious if they call. Uh, Rush back in. Maybe he's gotten the ability to talk a little bit further about what his first hand is. Although, if we have other individuals who are as qualified, if not more, and have had more first hand experience, then maybe you know they don't need to talk to Grush. I know. I think they even talked about getting Tim uh, Tim Gallaudet in there as well. Um, how much he you know knows first hand? Um, I'm not sure. I know uh, you know Burchett. I think mentioned that he. Um, did want to get him on the stand, so certainly wouldn't hurt. Um, but yeah, I'm getting excited. I want to know what you guys think. Uh, it, it, the ball just keeps on rolling forward. Um, regardless of you know what the haters or the or the, the media isn't talking about, because you know, I think Ross Colhart said it really great. Is like they don't matter anymore. I mean, at this point, it's like you know, keep, people keep waiting for for them to, and they they'll eventually have no choice but to address this because. They'll either be allowed to or they'll feel like, well, enough people are acknowledging this that we're, we're, we're idiots if we don't start talking about it. So, yeah. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And that'll do it for this one. And I'll see you on the flip side. Peace.